Welcome to the LA Business Podcast, a forum for business owners and senior executives to share the experiences about the elements that drive their success. Your host is Robert Brill, CEO of BrillMedia.co. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of the LA Business Podcast. Today our guest is Roy Edwards, President and Chief Operating Officer of Capital Presence. Thanks for being with us today. Yeah, thanks for having me on, man. Pumped to be here. So tell us a little bit about Capital Presence. Who's it for and what do you guys do? Yeah. So Capital Presence, we are a federal contracting agency first and foremost. So about 90% of our business is done through the federal government, where our founding members are all former federal employees. So we were inside the federal government at one point in time as full-time employees. We saw the inner workings of the government, uh, try to understand as much as possible why certain red tape is there and and why things are done a certain way. We we got a lot of pushback while we were working there as innovators. We we specialize in process uh, automation, which is which at the time when we were government employees was kind of a bad word, right? It was kind of the thought process that we were automating jobs away from people, which the government doesn't really like to do that. So we we ultimately skipped skipped town, <laughs> resigned. Uh, people called us crazy, but but we left the government. And so now what we do is we help uh, organizations, we help uh, agencies adapt to new technologies. Uh, Microsoft Technologies is a big part of what we do. We're Microsoft Silver Partners. And so we, we help them automate business processes, saving them time and money, which ultimately saves taxpayer money as well. Uh, and then on the other side of that, the commercial side of the business, we, uh, we help organizations um, find those process holes where we're doing a lot of manual processes and we help them automate and cut subscription costs where they might have you know five six seven applications that may or may not do all the same thing so we help them help them cut those down so that we're minimizing costs and again we want to increase production as cheaply as possible so so you spent three years at the FDA and your ti- your last title there was lead SharePoint developer so that's Microsoft's SharePoint yes sir yep so that's interesting. I, I, I have a, a very painful relationship with SharePoint. <laughs> Most um, people do. Yeah. I, I That doesn't surprise me. Like, it's interesting because uh, we had a really talented executive come on board. He's now moved on um, to work at Spotify, but he brought it. He was like, okay, if, you know, I need you to use SharePoint. I was like, all right, cool. Whatever you need. And we moved away from Dropbox. And holy cow, like I'm ready, 100% ready, like probably the next month and a half to move away from SharePoint and back into Dropbox. Yeah. Because it's driving me nuts. It keeps it keeps failing on me. Like my, my files, they don't sync. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the biggest uh, requests that I got from people. And so let me take a step back for a second and say, yeah, I was, when I was there uh, at the at the Food and Drug Administration, so I, the, the years that I were there were during the Obama administration. And so I was, I was at the, the Food and Drug Administration with the Office of Generic Drugs. And if you know anything about politics in the United States, uh, President Obama had a very uh, big influence on the FDA and on generic drugs. Uh, that was a part of the uh, Affordable Care Act or Obamacare, whatever, you know, however you reference it, that's what it was. And it, and it rolled out a whole lot of... Um, ways that generics could be more easily available to people. And so part of that meant they had to increase collaboration and increase uh, document communication. And so I architected SharePoint for uh, the Office of Generic Drugs with about 600 employees. And so I stood the whole thing up, went through all the training, managed all the contractors. And the number one request that I got out of people, and I helped uh, bio, I helped um, a lot of new drugs. I held, those are the different offices within the FDA. I became like an ip, ipso facto consultant, and the, a lot of the number one request we got was, "Can you make SharePoint not look like SharePoint?" Because it's interesting. It was ugly as sin, and uh, and people ran into a lot of different syncing problems, and they tried to use it like Dropbox, where to say, "I just want my files here. I just want to dump my files and be able to get to them." You know, just do that for me. But the way that SharePoint is designed and the way that uh, the file system within SharePoint uh, and within Microsoft is designed is that SharePoint is meant to be your intranet. That's where your your employees should start their day. It it should be their news. It should be their documents. It should be uh, collaboration. It should be communication. It should be um, FAQs, SOPs, that sort of a thing where 
you can start your day in your controlled, secure environment. You can share things out through, uh, you know, the tr- the typical Dropbox like URL link. You know, anyone with this URL can can view or edit or whatever. Right. That that's just a part of SharePoint. But I hear your frustrations, and so that's why we developed a lot of what we do is because we noticed there's not a lot of help out there. There's a lot of people who are just understand document management and they understand naming conventions, but that's only part of it. So understanding how the security around your documents sh- should be built, understanding naming convention, understanding how to share and manage your documents, that takes a lot. And so we help in and we, we step in and we help with governance. We, under, uh, we build out naming conventions and we, and we help organizations get a, a better control of their, of their documents and of their data because you don't want to be that company who, uh, who ends up on uh, CNN or, or Fox News or whatever that has been the latest data dump and you're the guy who, uh, who's been hacked, right? So right. we help organizations do all of that stuff. But I, I feel your pain with SharePoint. I, I apologize for the software. No. <laughs> it's not you. Let me ask you a question. That's a really good point. You know, a lot of our standard operating procedure li- lives on OneNote. Mm. Um, is that like what? What's a good tool to use that is outside of OneNote, or how can I replicate that book system outside yeah. of SharePoint? Is that yes. even possible? Well, yeah, sure. So the way that you're probably doing it is you have your books. And so inside of your books, maybe your book is called SOPs. And then every single one of your pages within your book is the different SOPs. Is that how you guys have it it set up? So what you could do to replicate that in the Microsoft SharePoint environment or the SharePoint world. Outside of SharePoint. Oh, you want me to do it outside of SharePoint? That's the question, right? Like the, the interesting part is like, I think we weren't using... We're not using SharePoint for what it's yeah. supposed to be used for. Like we, we really just want Dropbox. And what we do really, what we, what I like about it a lot is the ability to, um, to collaborate on, on a single document. That's yeah. really cool. And I yeah. would miss that inside, inside Dropbox. Yeah. But the fact that I can't actually like re- reliably have my files on my computer kills me. Yeah. So you can sync your, so if you go into the SharePoint library, Mm -hmm. you can sync it. There's a little button that says sync and that, that will sync your drive to your OneDrive. And then your OneDrive can live on your desktop through your file explorer. So you can uh, sync your, your documents that way. Now I will caution you in doing that. um, A lot of we're moving the, the move and the push is to the cloud. Right. Everybody wants their documents on the cloud. And in doing so, hardware providers, you know, uh, Apple and uh, Dell and HPE and Microsoft Surface, you're seeing these computers that, you know, used to have these huge drives, used to have huge hard drives. And it was like, we want more storage. You know, that, that used to be the big push. And now that we've started moving to the cloud, you're starting to see more and more laptops with like eight gigs of storage, which is like a phone. Yeah, yeah. Right, we have cell phones with more storage than that. So a gig, mine has half a half a half a T. Right, which which was not uncommon, just you know, a few years ago. But now you're starting to see these sleeker computers with the touch screen, unless you're Apple. And then you you have these this reliance on cloud storage. And so when you when you sync your drive, wherever it is, Dropbox, SharePoint, you know, wherever, when you're syncing it back to your computer, you're you're pushing that data back onto your computer and you could run into performance issues if you're trying to run podcast video editing or Premiere or, you know, uh, whatever. So that's where you run into performance issues. So you, you want to be careful with how much you really keep on your desktop. Uh, you also want to make sure that your cloud is that single source of truth. You know, that that's what we preach so much here is, that, you know, you want to ensure that there's a single source of truth, that you're not uploading your your documents. So we do a lot of agile project management and maybe you're using Jira or uh, Asana or Monday or whatever. You're using a project management tool. What about Rike? What do you think about Rike? I've never used Rike. Okay. We so, just we just signed on to Rike. Like literally yesterday I sent the documents. I, lo- I love the way they look. I love the, I love the way it like feels. We were yeah. using Monday.com earlier. Yeah. And I, I was always so focused on how do I make sure Monday.com works that I couldn't really right. wrap my head around the stuff that was rolling around in my head. It was yeah. not useful for me. Yeah. And so that's, that's it, it, it's less on the overall software. 
right. right? Is is whenever you're going into an organization, you always want to take a look at how do you do business. Right. It, it, you shouldn't try and force a software to to or or force your business to fit a software. You know, you you should find the software that works best for your business. And maybe SharePoint's not the best fit for you. Um, SharePoint does a lot. And there's Microsoft Teams, make sure, you know, making sure that you're utilizing Microsoft Teams if you're using SharePoint and make, you know, you utilize OneDrive the way it should be used. And if you're using OneNote for your SOPs, I always like to use SOPs as uploaded uh, through a PDF into a SharePoint document. That way you can manage through metadata, create views and increase searchability around it. Uh, and then you have your version history. Uh, whereas one one note, uh, it's not really built for version history. Uh, so, so that's why I like to. to is, there, is there is there is there a second is there a second software that you recommend for um, for SOPs? Like if you if you don't want to use what Microsoft's suite. So a, a place, if I heard you correctly, so a place where you I could upload and house my SOPs. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I mean, SharePoint's my number one. Obviously, that's where I am. That's where I came from. Like that's, that's what I do. Um, Dropbox, I guess is okay. Um, I, if you, if you really want to get into it for the cheapest way to house your SOPs is cloud. So that would be like an AWS S3 environment or a Microsoft Azure. Cause then you're housing your documents at the cheapest price possible because your SOPs, you know, they're not, maybe they're not pulled up every single day constantly. They're not like a proposal that you're sending out to, to an end client uh, that then is maybe like constantly being opened, edited, whatever. An SOP, once you write it, they're, yeah. And so it is what it is. Maybe somebody will have to reference it when you get a new employee or a new hire or some, something like that. So you want to, when you're, you're storing it, SharePoint's not always the cheapest place to store documents and neither is Dropbox, especially when you got to pay by, um, you know, sometimes it's by the gig. So you gotta, you gotta be careful with, with, um, with where you're storing and why you're storing it. So I would look into like an S3, uh, or a Microsoft Azure, like a blob storage or something like that. Um, cause those are, you, those are cheaper. And the, the types of companies you work with, how, like how big are they? And then you, do you normally work with, with companies who are like, so you said 90% of your business is with the federal government. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But, but we do work with uh, small to mid size. Uh, I mean, I could, I could name drop a few, I guess, if you want me to. Um, and so like we, we work with Hilton worldwide. Um, we work with uh, a lot of GovCon agencies. So companies who are highly regulated that do business with the government. Um, uh -huh. we've supported, uh, Mantec international. Uh, we've supported, uh, Booz Allen. We supported salient CRGT. So there, there's a lot of those like big name, con you know, big name government contracting agencies that have to abide by those compliance. So they they come to you and they say, look, we need we need uh, we need store we need to like organize our our information, and you'll most likely recommend SharePoint, or they know they want SharePoint, and then they come to you because you do SharePoint, and you'll implement that for them. Yeah, so we're we're Microsoft specialists. Got um, it. So you know, if somebody's using uh, Dropbox, they're probably not coming to, to coming to us if they're if they're married to Dropbox. Now, if they're using you know, a share drive and they don't know what to do. We get that a lot where people are looking to, to migrate from an on-prem device, a server that they have in their, in, in their closet down the hall, then they got the AC pumping in it and then they want to move to the cloud. Uh, we, we do that a lot. Yeah. We're kind of like, um, what's the name of that show on HGTV where people call them in to organize their closets or whatever. It's like organize this or something like that. We're like yeah. those guys, yeah, but, yeah, yeah. but for your documents, you know? Um, how, how do people find you? Yeah. So there, so capitalpresence.com. So that's where you'd be able to, to find us. And we, we have a whole run through of what it is that we do there from process automation to, uh, you know, process development to, to, to SharePoint. So, uh, you know, we have a technical audit process where we go through, well, you get, there's a self-evaluation portion of that. We're just kind of asking questions saying, you know, how do you do business? Uh, how do you capture your processes? How do you collect data? How do you guys communicate? What links do you use to for a meeting? Do you, are you using Zoom and WebEx and Microsoft Teams all on the same platform? Because we could cut a couple of those out. You know that that so that's what part of the process is to go through and just see how you're using your technology. Because I I like this I like this image of a woman just like 
defeated just with defeated. her head down on her computer. That's because that's like that's, that's been all of us this year, you know? <laughs> like 2020, all every single one of us has been that woman at some point. You know, March came along and we had to leave the office, and they're like, All right, stand-ups on Zoom. You know, we're and, and everybody was like overloaded. Yeah. <laughs> Just it's completely, so completely overloaded, you know, and and so that's where we step in. We've been doing remote solutions, and we've been working with Microsoft Teams, doing Teams development since 2016. And so, previous to this whole COVID 2020, we'd go into organizations and we'd talk with them. And the bigger organizations, most of our clients were enterprise and government, and they kind of understood the whole remote work. But, but how we, do they? How do enterprise and government? find you like is it word of mouth is it marketing is it seo tell me about that yeah so it's 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 we find them basically is what it is so when you when you're doing government um there are uh what are they called F, frqs frp request for proposal re- request for request. rfp yeah rfp there you go uh, yeah. I, sh- I should know that by now and um and so those will go out and so we're a certified woman-owned small business and so we have a Dunn's number and Sam number, and we had to go through all that paperwork stuff that really for us started uh, like 2015-ish is when we started to go through all of that process. Um, and then, you know, so you get your partners and you build up your relationships and you hyper-focus on what it is that you do. And so we we niched in and we handcuffed ourselves to Microsoft with, that's been our marriage. And, you know, we like I said, we're Microsoft partners and it's been a good marriage for us. And then whenever an RFRP comes out, you know, it took years to build up relationships with the, with the big guys because uh, they need small business. And there's a lot of set asides that come out of the government that say, Hey, this is a woman owned set aside. This is a small business set aside. This is a veteran set aside. And so we partner with other organizations all the time uh, that need help with, uh, you know, Microsoft 365 transition, Microsoft teams, whatever it is. Now the, 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 what you were probably looking for in that question was what are we using for to get in touch with some of the, the clients that, that we do go out and chase or, or they find us on the commercial side of things. And absolutely we do SEO and we have a podcast and we do email marketing. We do Facebook ads. We dabble on Instagram. We tried to be disruptors. So, you know, the, the federal government contracting world is, they get a bad rep and a lot of the organizations and the companies that do business with the government, they have this title called the beltway bandits, right? Yeah. There are these like chop shops that uh, don't really specialize in anything. And then they go out and hire people off the street. And then those people are their products. And they're just basically a, a, a recruiting agency that fills, fills jobs. And so I did not know that's what beltway bandits is. I've heard that. I'm sure there isn't there like a show uh, at some point on like CNN or Fox or one of these MSNBC called Beltway Bandwidth. Yeah. Bandwidth. Yeah. And so it's just, it's these big contracting agencies that, you know, in theory steal, you know, they're not actually stealing money, but they are preying on these FRPs and FRQs to come out and say, we have, you know, the necessary uh, past performance or whatever to go after this when really it's not the it's it's the name of the organization not really the expertise of the organization and then they go out and they hit indeed or linkedin and blow blow these the blow up the de- the developers uh, dms and say hey come work for us we'll give you a pay raise what is it that you're doing and then they sell those resumes to the government under their name and collect and so we saw that being federal government employees we saw this these people coming in that that had their resumes were they were jumping around every six months because they were just moving around from company to company because it's just it's whatever badge you're wearing that week. It's not really the the top company. It's it's you know the developers who are doing the work, and so That's we fast. wanted to yeah we wanted to change all that. Uh, we so we developed our own methodologies and we went in and we said no 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 we're not gonna you know we're not gonna charge those outrageously you know, crazy prices for something that can be done quicker, better, fast, you know, quicker, better, faster over here. Uh, And so that's where we started to gain traction. And like I said before, we've been doing this technology since 2016. And before COVID, people would come, you know, we'd be meeting with those people and they'd be like, ah, you know, 
that's a luxury, you know? And then this year, it, it, it's become a necessity, something that a lot of the, the larger organizations already knew. But now we've been able to, to tap in with the small businesses, the small midsize, where, you know, who have five or six employees, but now they can't go meet at their Starbucks or whatever it is. You know, they need those remote uh, internal solutions like what you're talking about, SharePoint, Microsoft Teams, whatever. They hop, they're they running through those Zoom fatigues like everybody else are, you know. Sure. So so I'm looking at, there, there's a tool that we use called Ahrefs and um, there's some pretty great links, links back. But I also think it's interesting. It looks like you have your uh, URL link back from clients that you have too, I, I think. Mm-hmm which is fantastic. Uh, we don't develop websites, so we don't have the benefit of that, but that's, that's fantastic. So when you, when you do marketing, cause you know, the really, the, the focus here of our, of our podcast is to help people understand how they can grow and scale their businesses. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. You know, so, if you had, if you had a, a, a pie and you broke it up into pieces, what relatively speaking, would you say, obviously without divulging anything that you don't want, shared publicly what would you like what are the one the number one the number two and the number three sort of general buckets or channels where you where you find 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 business yeah so i think the first thing that you have to do uh is understand social platforms and that people aren't on every platform because they want to better their business processes you know, people don't go on Instagram because they uh, they want accounting services, right? They they want to look at pictures or or like calm themselves down through motivational quotes or or double tap pictures of you know their grandson hitting a, hitting hitting a base hit in t ball, right? And so when you understand the way that people are going to certain platforms, that's when you can take a look and push your products in innovative ways to get their attention. So a good example of this is there is a there there is a a strip mall a, a a group of people who owned a strip mall, and so what they did was they used Instagram to create this strip mall as a hot spot to to hang out, showing video you know showing videos showing pictures of people dancing as they just left a shop that was. Um, you know, they were bought a new pair of shoes or, or whatever. Right. And so you're selling this like lifestyle that, that works with the platform that you're on. And the reason why they do that is because they want to engage with these potential shoppers, not because they want the shoppers to come buy from these stores because they want the stores to see that they have eyeballs. So those stores will then buy retail space there. So instead of them going out and say, our retail space is the cheapest out there. Come on out. Look at this empty store. They're saying, look at how much fun people are coming here and buying Nikes and, and whatever it is else that they're buying there. And then once they attract the consumer, because that's why people are on the platform, then they can backdoor the retail shoppers with that as an extra tool. So that was something we had to learn the hard way. When we first oh, came about that. Yeah, when we first came out, we were like, well, we're going to be on Instagram, obviously, because people are on Instagram, you know? Uh, And so we went on Instagram and we were just like, "Uh, click here to learn more about documents. And nobody cares, right? And so we were like, well, how can we reach entrepreneurs? You know, because that's who we care about. Or how can we turn, how can we seem to be, uh, you know, we want to be disruptors. So how can we do that? And so we started to focus on, uh, the culture within our workplace. So if you check out our Instagram, it's like uh, we're we're lightsaber fighting. We are there's aliens. There's I think there's one where like we did a skit where like I had come back from the Area 51 raid. There was like we're just doing all these different things to uh, to showcase that we're real people and that you can communicate with us because we're we're real people. We're just out here having fun. We promote a, a fun lifestyle. And then that we communicate with entrepreneurs. Uh, and so then. We, which I, I think is, you know, what's interesting to me about that is in context of these beltway bandits that you described earlier, mm-hmm. that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And you're not using it as a direct response medium, although I would say that Facebook and Instagram can be used as a direct response medium. We are using it as a direct response medium. Yeah, if you, you absolutely can. Media. 
Yeah, you absolutely can. Right. I mean, I mean, it can totally work that way. Um, but everybody else is doing it that way. You know, so so you in order to to disrupt an industry like ours, our, we're not the same as every other industry out there. But it's in all, all of our competitors, if you go to their websites, they all look the same. They're all stock photos of somebody like standing in front of servers or whatever, right? And so we were like, we're not going to do that. We, we're going to have cartoons and we have a mascot. So we have Cloudette, the little cloud. She, she'll wear a Nationals hat one day or, or she right now, I think our social media platforms, she's wearing a Santa hat. You know, and so we were just trying to be different in every aspect because it's one thing to tell people that we're not belt, beltway bandits. It's one thing that for you to tell your target audience that you're different than everybody else, but you have to show that you're different than everybody else. So saying and speaking things are one thing, doing and acting and being, that's a whole nother thing that people actually, actually uh, pay attention to. And there is, I, I, I'm not going to get religious on you or anything like that, but there's a quote that there was, um, it was a, uh, a saint. I, I forget the name of the saint, but he said, you should, you should show, you should, uh, preach the gospel at all times in your life. And sometimes you should use words. That's because people don't care what you have to say. They want to see how you're living and how you're acting. And they'll use that to make mm -hmm. their decision on whatever it is. Do you, do you have someone who like when you when you deploy marketing do you have someone internally who's managing it it sounds like you have to because yeah. all that coordination with the logo and stuff like that's a lot of work yeah so uh at first no we didn't it was all me and if you, if you want to go to our facebook page and look at the first ever video it is terrible and that's because i did it and so our logo was completely different. Uh, we we grabbed like an audio uh, script that we wrote off and 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 hired somebody off of Fiverr to read it, and we put it over like uh, basically like a slideshow. I don't remember the 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 what I used to build it, um, but it was terrible. It was awful. Stock footage. It was basically everything that we didn't want to be. And so I realized very quickly that although I'm creative. I am not a marketer. And so there are a ton of people who want to get into marketing. Yeah. And there are a ton of people out there who understand marketing. And so what we did originally was we hired an intern and we told them what we wanted to do. Hey, this is what we want to do. And the most important thing of that was we let them have creative control. We said, hey, this is what we want to do. This is as much as we want to portray. Have fun with it. And that's why if you look at our Instagram, there are videos that have nothing to do with what we do and everybody was like why are you doing this is because we want to have fun and we want to portray that we're having fun and so we had we had um interns at first and then eventually we hired the intern uh to be full-time and then we we brought on as we grew and scaled we brought on a, a marketing uh organization to to come on and help with with our you know email campaigns we produce a podcast that sort of a thing that that helps with all that but it didn't start that way. We didn't go out there and be like, all right, we're going to spend 20 grand on marketing this year as this startup. Uh, you know, yeah. no. Yeah. The reason you can't do that is because you don't know what you're selling. In the first, yes. like, unless you're, unless you're like Quibi and you have a bunch of money and they failed at it for a number of different reasons. But, you know, for us entrepreneurs, it's like, you got to figure out what the product market fit is first. And you really, the best way to do that is over time. Yes. And you can't be a Swiss army knife. That's another lesson that we learned in the very beginning was if, again, if you look at that first ever ad we made, it said, there's a, there's a scroll. It's like, our experts do this. And there's just like this movie scroll, you know, and it's like graphic design, SEO, digital marketing, uh, Microsoft SharePoint. It's, it lists off like 30 things that are not connected with them. It, none of them are connected. And, and it was like, all right, Hey, we're your technical help. Come on in, you know? And, and it was it you. How long did it take you to get there? To understand our real product? Yeah. About about six months, six months to a year to understand our, our true niche and our true product. Uh, because in the beginning, like a lot of entrepreneurs uh, and startups, we were grasping for for money to to keep the lights on. Sure. You know, we're like, hey, we'll build your website. Sure. That's not what we do. We know how to do it. 
Uh, and then from there, people were like, hey, can you do SEO? And we're like, uh, we'll figure it out, <laughs> you know? But eventually you get to this, and I, and I use this example a lot where there's this landscaper. And so the landscaper, what he specializes in is he will mow your lawn, trim your edges, and get and pick up leaves in the fall, right? And so he goes to a house and he says, excuse me, sir, uh, do you want some landscaping work? And the guy's like, absolutely. Oh, and hey, by the way, while you're doing my landscaping, um, there's some leaves on the roof. Can you get those down while you're getting the rest of the leaves? And he's like, sure. It goes to Home Depot, Lowe's, local local home goods store, whatever, buys a ladder, right? Has to buy a ladder, gets on the roof. You know, now he's on the roof. And while he's up there, he says, hey, sir, while I'm up here, do you want me to fix your roof? I noticed there's a, a hole in your roof, right? And he starts tacking the roof. Now he had to go back to the, the home goods store, buy a hammer, buy uh, you know, tar or whatever. I don't know how to patch a roof, but he buys a bunch of stuff and, and patches it up. Right. And so then he says, Oh, Hey, why am I, I'll clean your gutters. He has to buy a snake and he has to do all these things. And so at the end of the day, he's made $1,500 and he's like, Hey, I spent all day with this one client. He's out to, he's having a beer with this, with a, a competitor. And he's like, I made 1500 bucks today, man. I don't worry. I got the tab. Well, his competitor might have not made $1,500 that day. Maybe he made, you know, a thousand dollars that day. Uh, but he was able to bring on four clients and he was able to replicate his services over and over and over again, keeping his overhead low. Whereas the other guy, maybe he made $1,500 gross, but he spent a whole lot of money and he was only able to turn one client because, and wasn't able to replicate all these other things. So now the ladder sitting around, he's got extra roof material he's he got all this stuff that he's not going to use and so that's where you have to understand that whatever it is that you're doing you have to be an expert at it or pretty damn close and you got to be replicatable because you want to be able to you know template it out understand the processes write sops quickly and be able to you know mcdonald's theory the hell out of your clients you know if they get a big mac in california and you get a big mac in virginia it's the same damn Big Mac, you know? So you got to be careful with trying to be everything to everyone. And that's where we narrowed it down to Microsoft. You know, we were like, you know what? We're damn good at this and we're going to be damn good at this. And that's what we do. McDonald's thing to my team as well, because we're building a, uh, a, a recurring revenue business and we have to find templates and formats that, are proven and work and, and we, we have, it took us a year and a half to figure out which business we're going to choose to be in. And then in about another six months to actually gain some traction in that business. And yeah. once we, we did really well, but yeah. that was a long year and a half for us. It, it's, and you know, the six months to a year for us was not gaining traction. It was just figuring out what the hell that we did. And then after you figure out what the hell you did, now you got to figure out a way to tell your story and market it and tell other people. Cause that was a, another big problem for us was, okay. We said, we finally figured out that we help people work wherever we build remote solutions. Right. It's a great story, by the way. Thanks. And, and I think so too. And so we, once we were able to, to build it out and we were able to get, Hey, we help you work wherever, you know, and then, and then people started asking, so, okay, so what does that mean? And then we went from zero to 60 in technical speak. And we were, and people were like, whoa, uh, I, I don't know. What are you saying? Like, I, and so we had to take our pitch and fine tune it. We changed it so, so much where we were saying, okay, we do this, we do that. But it's all saying the same thing, just explaining it a little different. And then we came down to simplify. We simplify your business. That could be your processes. It could be how you do business. We just simplify you. So you can free your, your time to do other things. Yeah. That's fascinating. Well, um, how has the COVID, um, COVID economy been treating you? Yeah. So uh, I'll, I'll tell a story on that, on how we got here, because COVID has actually been pretty good to us. Um, and so we started our business, and I believe this is how we, we met, was, so I have Crohn's disease. And so I, I was diagnosed 12 years old. I was a little kid. Um, and so I, I was going through my professional career, uh, the ability to, to have remote work, work from home, 
has always been really important to me because I have to go see a doctor or whatever it is, right? Some days that I'll just be keeled over in so much pain, I can't go to work. I can't physically go to work, but my mental aspect, I could still do whatever I need to be able to do. So being able to work remote has always been top level tier of what it is that I want to do and who to be. Um, And so that was priority one when starting our organization was we're going to help people be as productive at home as they are at the office. And that's where in 2016, we came up with the work wherever hashtag. And we had work from a beach was like our, uh, we had a domain name that we bought work from a beach that was like, had our products and how we can help, you know, Hey, don't, don't ruin summer. You can work wherever, you know, go to the beach. And so we had this whole remote mentality built into our business so that when COVID did happen, we were shined a light on our traffic spiked and, and people who were searching for Microsoft teams landed on us. Our chat bots went crazy. And so we went to this point where we had more people coming to our site and more people asking for help than we could respond to. Uh, and so we had to, to bring people on and we had to help, you know, thank, thank God there was a PPP loan because it, it helped us out a lot and be able to keep, cause like I mentioned earlier, Hilton worldwide was our biggest commercial client. And as you could imagine, the hoteling industry right now is, is tough. So in certain aspects, it hurt us just like every other business or in a lot of businesses out there, but in other aspects, we had to innovate and we had to change. We, that's when we launched the podcast and, and that's when we started to showcase the Microsoft teams and, and, you know, really bring that to the forefront to be like, look, we've been doing this for a long time. Now we know you, that you want this. And we started providing real life examples outside of you can vacation more. Now it became, you can do everything that you want to do from anywhere. So COVID has been, I mean, it's been hell for in a lot of ways, but at the same time, when you're, when you're in front of a problem, you know, you can curl up and, and, uh, you know, let it, let it steamroll over you. Uh, or you can think of innovative ways to market around it and to reach out and help people. I mean, I did more free consultations with people on how to utilize Microsoft Teams than ever before. Some of them became clients, some of them didn't. But you know that that client, when they told to somebody else, we would get a referral. Hey, how'd you hear about us? Oh, well, you did a training for so-and-so. And we're like, we did? Oh, that's right. Yeah, that was a free consultation we did. Okay, cool. Yeah. Well, hey, thanks for thanks for thinking of us, you know? So yeah, in, in many ways it's it sucked. But in other ways, you gotta take advantage of the, you know, you gotta play the cards you're dealt, right? <laughs> What is uh what what do the next um six to twelve months look like for your business? Like what how are you growing, changing, scaling? What's the thing that you're tackling right now? Yeah. So right now we are heavy in proposal season. So uh there's three or four federal proposals that we've had eyed and targeted for uh, a long time. The proposal cycle in the federal government, it, they say that it's about 18 months. So we've been working on things, building relationships. Uh, and it also happens that they all going to drop here December 2020, right? So our next six months could look really, really, really good. Uh, or uh, Robert, I could be hitting you up in six months for a job kind of a thing. Nah, it won't be that bad. But you know, it'll, it, it, that's kind of the way that our, our next six months will look at. Hopefully it looks really great. We've been doing a lot of preparation. Uh, oh, sorry, my daughter just walked in. Um, we've been doing a whole lot of preparation to make sure that our next six months look really, really good. Uh, we've put in a lot of hard work to do so. Um, and I, I think that it's going to be great. I mean, we, we made the most of 2020. Our revenues steadily increased. We outdid 2019. Um, so we've been doing great and I expect 2021 to, to do even better. I'll share with you some ideas uh, on how you can uh, bulletproof that risk of uh, diversify. Yeah, please. Um, well, cool. As we, as we wrap up, I'll do that offline. As we wrap up, I want to uh, give you an opportunity. Tell us where people can find you again, how they can reach out to you. And from a, from a B2B perspective outside the federal government, who, uh, who are the best types of companies that you can do the most for? Yeah. So thank you for that. So, so, so you can find us at capitalpresence.com. 
Uh, we're on all social media platforms at Capital Presence. Uh, we have a business podcast that's at innovarepodcast.com. Uh, we, we interview a whole lot of different entrepreneurs and provide, it's a free podcast that we interview entrepreneurs, seeing how they're doing and how they're innovating and how they're tackling certain things. So uh, we take great pride uh, in that. And then how we're helping uh, organizations outside of the federal government, uh, anywhere from startup uh, to enterprise, we help organizations get a hold of their technology. Uh, what we'd say is we liken it to cutting the cord of cable. You know, a couple of years ago, we were all sold this promised land of, uh, you know, being able to watch your favorite shows on demand and it'll be cheaper. And why would you have cable? Right. So we all did it. We all bought in. And now we all have 12 different streaming platforms and we're paying four times as much money as we should be. And we're all trying to figure it out. Right. My, so that's, my, wife, my wife likes the Brit box. Right. We all have something, right? We all have some crazy application that we only watch one show on. And it's like, why do we have this again? Oh, right. My one favorite show is on this platform, but I need it. And so that's, that's happened in business too. With the, with the cloud boom, SaaS platforms, that's uh, software as a service, has had a huge boom. And now there are applications that are specific to everything. I mean, think of Zoom and WebEx and all these applications that are standalone platforms. And so now people have multiple logins and they have multiple windows that they have to juggle. And so we go in and we say, look, we know you cut the cord for a reason. So let's let's take it back a little bit. Let's get your operating expenses under control and let's set you up for a more productive year going forward. So we can help the startups do that. We can help enterprise do that. We can help any organization do that. And we really thrive with organizations who have to abide by some sort of compliance or do business or are regulated by the, by the federal government. Awesome. Roy Edwards, president and chief operating officer of Capital Presence. Thanks for being with us today. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. 